I uh, work at the Applied Research Center here uh, on the campus in Wageningen called Wageningen Food and Biobased Research. And I lead a fermentation group within this uh, Applied Research Center. And basically what we do is uh, convert cheap waste streams into high value components uh, using fermentation for both uh, non-food and food applications. We are involved in using fermentation for production of all kinds of uh, food ingredients. So there we basically convert as cheap as possible waste streams using selected organisms and producing um, uh, ingredients um, that are now currently produced uh, in more chemical ways. And uh, examples are uh, vitamins, flavors, uh, antimicrobials. Um, we see uh, lots of possibilities also for production of microbial oils as a replacement for palm oil. Um, low calorie sweeteners like erythritol and triolose. Um, these are all processes where fermentation can play uh, a crucial role. Questions uh, or uh, let's say demands in this uh, sector are growing. So we see an expansion of the whole fermentation technology in this sense. And what is I think interesting uh, also for this panel is that uh, in producing these uh, different ingredients using fermentation, you also get a lot of biomass being formed. And this biomass will contain 50% or more protein. And most of these proteins are very useful uh, in food and feed uh, applications. And if we can, uh, if we take, for instance, acetic acid, if, of course, which is massively produced using fermentation. If you look worldwide, the amount of uh, acetic acid which is produced by fermentation, we calculated that about 10 million metric tons of protein are produced annually. So I don't know how many um, Disney worlds and cows this accounts for, but uh, it's a lot. Right? Bioethanol is of course even bigger, but processes like citric acids, also a few million uh, metric tons of protein produced annually in protein. And then you have lactic acid, you have various vitamins like vitamin C is a, of course a process where it also involves at least part of it is a fermentation process where a, a acetic acid bacteria or a gluconobacter is used and also their biomass is being formed. And these uh, biomass sources are growing because the amount of fermentations is growing. So this is going to be a huge source of proteins um, which are available. And if you talk about sustainability, you want to use them and you don't want to throw them away. So I see uh, tremendous options there and this is going to grow. Of course, um, we work with uh, a couple of uh, organisms. Uh, I just a few minutes ago shared a list of ingredients that we produce using fermentations and these are all different organisms, but these are all organisms that are what we call food grade. So they have been isolated from existing fermented products. So we have not introduced any kind of uh, new uh, microorganisms. And um, so in, in that respect, um, we are basically following legislation, but there is a, a, not only an aspect of the other organisms that we might want to use, but there is this aspect of using novel substrates that these organisms have never seen before. And that's what we do when we are converting different kinds of waste streams, side streams from the food industry, maybe from other industry, and we are using fermentation, we get a combination of a substrate and an organism that is not existing um, in nature. And in that case, uh, at least in Europe, uh, we will have to deal with uh, novel food legislation to get this through. So that is an, uh, that's sort of a challenge uh, that uh, we need to uh, uh, come over or that we need to deal with. Uh, one, another hurdle is basically the use of waste streams. Uh, are we allowed to use waste streams for uh, an, uh, eventually a food application? Those are other hurdles that need to be uh, tackled uh, before we can really leverage this uh, fermentation in the best way.